This monstrosity is what got us, however briefly, up to the top 10 on several 3D Mark world record score charts on hardware, but a couple things there. It's a little bit unfair because it's a Titan V and we haven't had one. We also have a 7980XE, so looks like it costs some money these days to get to the top of the charts. But while it is a little unfair from that aspect, we were still able to get further than we should have otherwise by slapping a liquid cooler to a Titan V. And now we have the thermal, the voltage, the power, and the clock results from doing this modification. This video is brought to you by the Gamers Nexus Anti-Static Mod Mat. Our Mod Mat uses a high quality anti-static surface with a rubberized finish. We also have a custom paint job on it, which includes reference points and cheat sheets for PCIe, EPS 12 volt and other power cables, along with quick reference thermal paste application guides, a screw sorter for your video card teardowns, and it includes a common ground point and a grounding strap to help protect the products you are working on from electrostatic discharge. Pre-order your mat now at the link in the description below. We've done a few of these mods now, and the reason they're cool is because they are literally cool. They're cooler than the air-cooled card. So this thing, because it is inefficiently cooled compared to the power that it is capable of putting out, is going to perform worse on charts. And just to get everyone up to speed, you may already know this, but NVIDIA's Boost 3.0 and the way Vega works with its own Boost version, they both have a clock dependency on thermals and then on power and voltage. We can solve for one of those things exceptionally easily. We can remove the cooler and put a better one on it. In our initial coverage of the Titan V, we actually tested this card stock versus this card stock with 100% fan speed and saw that it actually did help quite a bit. Unfortunately, at 100% fan speed, because the Titan V is quite powerful, we were still bumping up against the 83 to 84 Celsius wall before it starts to limit its clock headroom. If you talk to Nvidia, they will specifically note that this is not called throttling because by their definition of the term, it is not throttling. Uh, and instead, it is a limitation of how far boost will allow you to go. Now, for ease of terminology, I am going to call that throttling, because if it's not performing to its maximum potential, it's just sort of easier to call it that. Uh, they do have a point, but I think I have a point too. So in order to get past this first wall, we put a liquid cooler on it. Next wall is power. And for that one, you can't do much other than short the shunts, which we are doing in a separate video, and you'll see more about that soon. Uh, and that only helps so far as well. So what we can do here today is test the thermal difference, test the frequency stability, that's a big one, uh, and then the scoring differences. In addition to this, we can probe various points on the back of the card, which I'll show you later, to determine the actual input voltages to vCore and vHBM, as opposed to what a software reading might tell you, which is often at least slightly inaccurate. Typically, NVIDIA is locked to around 1.093 volts. We, with this mod, have been able to go beyond that because we're not thermal throttling and it has some extra headroom. Shunt modding, theoretically, might help a bit as well, but that's more of a current difference than anything. So, uh, let's go through the numbers. The, the big thing here is that it does objectively help to liquid cool these cars. We've shown that now for several NVIDIA devices and AMD devices, including Vega Frontier Edition, where interestingly, we showed that you can reduce power leakage by improving the cooling efficiency. Doing that with this card is the same thing. By reducing the, uh, the temperature of the die and the surrounding components, like the HBM dies, we are also reducing power leakage. With CPUs, as an easy example, every 10 degree drop in CPU temperature gets you about 4% less power consumption by way of reducing power leakage. Similar idea applies here, which means that with GPUs, you can then take that extra overhead that you've reduced from leakage and put it back into the core as a more efficiently utilized power to drive the core clock higher. Well, let's start out with a frequency analysis of the core for the Titan V. For this chart, we're looking at how additional thermal headroom gives us better boost clocks and sustains them for longer under heavier loads. This is over a period of roughly 25 minutes for a Firestrike Ultra burn-in, where we freeze frame on an intensive scene. We haven't applied any overclocks here. These are stock settings aside from the cooler on the hybrid. The air-cooled card starts off with a clock of about 1810 megahertz, 
and rapidly drops down to a range of 1600 to 1700 megahertz dictated by thermals. You'll notice that the GPU temperature sits steady at 83 to 84 degrees Celsius, which is the point at which Boost 3.0 encounters a thermal barrier. Updating charts to show the hybrid, you'll notice immediately that we have a higher boost frequency, which is what we want, and it is also a direct result of the improved cooling solution. We're at around 46 degrees for our GPU core temperature now, as opposed to 86 degrees, and we're plotting around 1800 megahertz for the core clock. The air-cooled card averaged closer to 1700 megahertz, so that's a big uplift for just a cooler swap. We're already at plus 100 megahertz, and it would be an even bigger gap if we had pushed below 40C, which we could do with a lower ambient temperature. To illustrate how this comes into play in briefer synthetic tests, this chart shows frequency over time during a loop-scripted 3D Mark, Firestrike, and Time Spy suite. Both tests have a 200 megahertz core and HBM2 offset applied, we even gave the air-cooled card some help, primarily by setting its blower fan to 100% speeds, or about 60 dBA of noise, far more than the liquid-cooled device. The difference is, again, that the liquid-cooled card manages to consistently sit at or above 2000 MHz, frequently hitting 2032 MHz peak, and the air-cooled card, meanwhile, has harder drop-offs throughout the longer test. We see this more toward the last few spikes, and it tends to sit about 100 megahertz behind the liquid-cooled hybrid card. And again, that's with its fan at 100% speed. So it is both obnoxious and maxed out. If we look at some results of the card with its fans and clocks restored to complete auto, including the fan speed that's a bit too low by default, we see even bigger performance swings. The frequency fall off as testing goes on is more noticeable, and we start to lose clocks to the tune of a few hundred megahertz in worst case scenarios. Liquid cooling is removing that thermal barrier completely, and instead putting us up against power barriers. Speaking of power, let's look at a voltage change. This is measured by probing the capacitors on the back of the card for V-Core, and the probe points for VHBM. This tells us the actual input voltage for the GPU, rather than some inaccurate software measurement. We saw a pretty big swing in voltage range after applying the hybrid mod. Removing the thermal cap meant that the card would permit itself to draw more power and use more voltage, which we see reflected in this table of minimum and maximum measured voltages. Stock and with air, we saw a range of 0.75 volts to 1.093 volts, the long known max for NVIDIA cards default and under stock conditions. HBM voltage sat at around 1.434 volts, Overclocking and overpowering the air-cooled card got it to 0.98 volts average, and that's lower than the previous 1.093 maximum. This is again because we were bumping hard into the thermal limitations, causing the card to throttle back. HBM voltage was a bit higher by nature of giving more power to the HBM, and also because the HBM wasn't under as much duress as the core. HBM2 has low heat flux, and it can deal with the heat better than the GPU core can. Our hybrid mod with stock clocks sat at 1.05 to 1.16 V-Core, higher than the non-overclocked air card, and it also ran a VHBM of 1.446 volts. Overclocking pushed us as high as 1.17, with 1.07 volts as the bottom line. VHBM ran at 1.45 to 1.46 in this scenario. The extra voltage is a major help and explains why clock stability is so much better when removing the thermal throttle. As for scores, we saw improvements in Firestrike Ultra as listed here. Highlighting first the full stock air-cooled card, we scored 7748 points for graphics, and with the stock clocked hybrid card, we scored 8149. That's already an increase of 5.2%, which is remarkable considering we have only changed the cooler thus far. Overclocked on the air-cooled card, we were at 8835 points with 100% fan speeds, or 92.65 on the hybrid mod. That brings us another 4.9% ahead of the air-cooled overclock. Firestrike Extreme is similar and shows nearly 5% gains from the stock Titan V to the stock hybrid card, with 4% gains from the overclocked air card and overclocked hybrid card. Sniper Elite 4 gives us a real-world example and shows the stock hybrid at 125 FPS average versus 115 FPS average on the air-cooled card. That's a gain of 8.1%, somewhat remarkably, and is a testament to how sensitive Sniper Elite is to frequency stability. The overclocked card pushes only marginally past where the air 
cooled overclock sat, and that's partially because we began bumping into CPU limitations. And just as a quick demo, if you want to check the voltage on your own card for NVIDIA, at least, well, for any of them, but what we do is we take a multimeter and then you can stick the ground into the ground on a Molex connector. So this is our GN mod mat to plug that here, which you can get at store.gamersnexus.net slash mod mat. With a real Molex connector, you'd ground there. So you just stick it into the Molex cable and let it sit. And then you take the other one and you can check any of the V core capacitors on the back of the card. So we can really, we can just check, uh, let's see what's a good one here. We just check this one if we wanted to. And you just tap that metal contact point on the side, and that'll give you a V-Core reading. You could also check the HBM voltage, uh, and that would be done by using the HBM contact points over here. So you just tap this one right here, and then you keep this in the Molex cable on your power supply, and that would give you VHBM. So that's how you read those in case you were curious. Basically, contact point on one of these, and then uh, VHBM you would get over here. So that's the hybrid mod. Once again, we've learned that improving the cooling solution has a big impact on how well NVIDIA's cards do. They have the clock headroom there. They can even tap into it. It's just a matter of whether or not the card permits itself to under the guidance of its restrictions of thermals, power, and voltage. So with a liquid cooler, we've resolved part of that problem. We're going to try a shunt mod next and see if shorting the shunts with liquid metal will allow us to trick the card into thinking it's drawing less current than it is. Because if you short the shunts, theoretically, it should throw the thing off a bit because the card assumes that those shunts are always five milliohms. Why would it be anything less? If we short them and change that, it's still assuming five milliohms, but we might be drawing more current as a result of that assumption. So hopefully we can get a bit further with it. Maybe not much, but you're not really looking at increased overclocks here, you're looking at better clock stability, which is what it's all about when you're trying to improve your low frame time, 99, 99.9 .9 percentile performance, what we call 1% and 0.1% lows, or when you're trying to include or improve rather your fire strike scores for things like hardware bot. So that's the mod. If you are interested in learning more, hit the link in the description below for the article. You can also buy our new mod mat that we did all this work on at store.gamersnexus.net slash modmat, or help us out directly on patreon.com slash gamersnexus, and subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.